welcome all. So, uh, we are carrying forward the process of learning about the say, say different other aspects of the capital structure and continuing with the process of uh, say uh, taxes and the corporate structure or the uh, say uh, impact of the taxes on the capital structure of the firm. In the previous class we discussed that the uh, capital structure is impacted by the taxes especially the borrowing part the debt part is uh, say impacted by the uh, taxes and uh, 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 say uh, we have seen in the previous class uh, uh, that how the corporate taxes impact the capital structure or maybe have the uh, say positive impact on the uh, debt capital because ultimately uh, when we have seen in the previous class that uh, the impact of uh, taxes on the say uh, borrowing was less severe as compared to the say equity capital and ultimately the combined income when we calculated of the say firms that one firm was a levered firm another firm was a unlevered firm. So, combined income of the debt holders and the say your uh, equity holders was higher in the levered firm as compared to the uh, say your <coughs> unlevered firm. So, it means in this case we have to uh, means be clear about that uh, say uh, uh, ultimately the taxes impact the capital structure and Morgulani and Miller also have accepted in their second proposition that because of the tax impact or the debt being tax deductible uh, or having the advantage of tax deductible, uh, it is cheaper uh, source of finance overall cost of capital goes down with regard to the debt and if you have the say equal amount of debt and equity in the capital structure then certainly the uh, cost overall cost of capital of the firm gets down. So, in the previous class we have seen the impact uh, on the say combined income of the debenture holders and the or the debt suppliers or the lenders and the equity shareholders uh, because of the corporate uh, taxes or the impact of the corporate uh, taxes on the capital structure. And now we will see the combined effect of the corporate taxes and the personal taxes and even uh, say taking into consideration the personal taxes along with the corporate taxes the combined income of the say uh, equity uh, hold, uh, shareholders or the uh, equity suppliers and the debt uh, suppliers or the lenders will be more in the levered firm as compared to the unlevered firm because say the debt having the tax deductible advantage. Uh, it uh, helps the firm to reduce the overall cost of capital and increase the total return to the equity shareholders. So, it means ultimately uh, because of this tax deductible nature of the debt finance or the borrowings uh, overall cost of capital uh, it goes down and, and, and the value of the firm maximizes. So, capital structure is getting affected because of the taxes both the corporate taxes and the personal taxes. So, let us see now that how the personal taxes are impacting the overall uh, capital structure of the firm and uh, say uh, what is the impact upon the combined uh, income of the shareholders and the lenders uh, after the personal taxes. Let us see about that. So, we will write here personal taxes, personal taxes and income of debt holders, income of debt holders and shareholders and shareholders <coughs> and shareholders. So, again we take here as the particulars, again we take here as the particulars and we take the forms A, this is a form A and this form is called as the unlevered form and this is the form B which is the levered firm right. So, uh, we are we are means carrying forward the say same example which we have done in the previous class where we have seen the impact of the corporate taxes on the income of the uh, say uh, combined uh, effect of the taxes on the income of the shareholders and the say lenders. So, we are carrying forward the same example here and we are going to see now the impact of the personal taxes along with the corporate taxes and how the overall cost of capital goes down and the income to the uh, say shareholders as well as the say debt suppliers or the lenders uh, gets affected. So, we have taken the two firms again firm A and firm B and if you take forward the or carry forward the previous example. So, you can say here that what was the income in that uh, say, uh, say previous case the income available to shareholder was how much? Income to shareholders. If you uh, recall that 
or if you see the previous lecture, so income to the shareholders we had calculated was because total income was uh, 10 lakh rupees. So, 50 percent was the tax uh, uh, so you call it as that was the corporate tax and remaining income which was passed on to the uh, equity shareholders was half and that was say here in this case 5 lakh rupees or the 500,000 rupees. In this case it came down to 260,000 rupees right. So, this was the income to the shareholders and now we uh, uh, say take the effect of the personal taxes less personal taxes and if you calculate the impact of the personal taxes. So, you can say we are, we are assuming that the tax personal tax rate is 30 percent right. We are assuming it as the personal tax rate is the 30 percent. So, if you take this rate as the 30 percent in both the cases on the debt as well as on the equity at the rate of 30 percent. So, in this case you can say what is the personal tax rate you have to subtract the personal tax and this is 150,000 we have to take this amount as the tax amount is the 150,000 rupees or the 150,000 rupees. So, this is the effect 150,000 rupees and in this case how much is the tax effect this is going to be only 78,000. So, you can say income available to shareholders after personal taxes, income to shareholders, income to shareholders after personal taxes I am writing here as a PT, how much is this income? This income is 350,000 right and in this case the income is 182,000. So, this is the income we have carried forward from the previous example and we have assumed the tax rate in this case is the 30 percent personal tax rate as the 30 percent. So, income to shareholders after the personal tax we have calculated is 350,182,000. So, now, we take into the second part the income to the debt uh, supplier or the debt holders. So, what was the income? Income to debt holders or the bond holders the income because in this firm it is an unlevered firm no debt is there whereas in this case the income was there and that we had calculated was 480,000 rupees. If we recall we had assumed that the total borrowing of the firm were the 4 million uh, rupees and uh, say that uh, say interest rate was 12 percent. So, the say uh, income to or interest cost to the firm and the income to the debt holder was the 480,000 rupees this is all in rupees. Right, we all are taking this in rupees. So, this is also in rupees 480,000 and here also we assume that the tax rate here is less uh, personal tax at the rate of 30 percent, personal taxes at the rate of 30 percent. So, how much is the tax? No tax here because there is no income because there is no debt uh, in the unlevered firm, but here in this case. Uh, uh, say personal tax at the rate of 30 percent. So, if you take this, this works out as 144,000. This works out as 144,000. So, finally, you can calculate as that income to income to debt holders, income to debt holders, uh, <coughs> income to debt holders after personal taxes after personal taxes. So, how much is that income to the debt holders after personal taxes? Income to debt holders after personal taxes. Uh, this income is here you call it as 0 because there is no uh, debt, but in this case the income is uh, 336 thousands. If you subtract from the 480 thousands the total income the tax component for 144 thousands. So, income to the debt holders after the personal taxes is 3 lakh 36 thousands and finally, the combined finally, the combined income combined income of shareholders and debt holders D oblique H shareholders and debt holders after personal taxes after personal taxes after personal taxes if you calculate this income. So, this uh, we have to if you take the combined effect of the income this will come here as uh, after personal 
taxes if you take this. So, you can say that here the only this income is there 350,000 rupees and in this case if you see this income will be how much this income is going to be the say, uh, say the income to the shareholders this much and this much. So, this works out as 5 lakh and 18 thousands 5 lakh and 18 thousands. So, you can say that the impact of the debt if any firm is having a some amount of the debt in their capital structure. So, you can say that amount of the debt is uh, going to create the uh, say, say the difference here and if you look at this the difference is going to be very clear in this case. So, uh, the total combined income if you look at in both the cases. So, combined income of the shareholders and debt holders after the personal taxes it is 3 lakh 50 thousand rupees in this case it is uh, 5 lakh and 18 thousand rupees because income to the shareholders after personal taxes is 182 thousands and the income to the debt holders after personal taxes is 3 lakh 36 thousands. So, it means combined income of the shareholders and debt holders after the personal taxes is this much and in this form it is this much right. So, it means ultimately when you talk about the whole thing. Uh, in terms of the corporate taxes and the personal taxes after taking into consideration the effect of both the corporate and the personal taxes even the levered firms stand at a better position and ultimate income to the say, say combined income to the shareholders as well as the debt holders or the say lenders is more as compared to the uh, income of the say shareholders in the unlevered firm because ultimately this is a very big advantage tax advantage or tax deductible advantage of the debt component is very big advantage and because of that uh, the because of this effect of taxes even the Morgan and Miller have also accepted in their second proposition that because of the tax factor or the tax advantages the ultimate ultimately uh, ultimate cost of capital uh, of the debt capital comes down and any firm which is having the mix of the debt and equity in their capital structure their overall cost of capital is going to get down and uh, ultimately the purpose of a good capital structure optimum capital structure is that overall cost of capital should be as low as possible or at least not low but at least optimum so that the, the return to the equity shareholders can be maximized maximizing the value of the firm. So, we have seen the impact of the taxes first we saw the impact of the corporate taxes and then we extended the same uh, example means remaining part towards considering the effect of the personal taxes and then we have seen here their ultimate income to the say, uh, uh, say combined income to the shareholders and debt holders in the levered firm is higher as compared to the unlevered firm. So, the tax deductible advantage or the tax deductible nature of the debt capital is means totally clear it is crystal clear. So, it means now after discussing four theories net income approach net operating income approach traditional approach and Modgalani Miller's the two propositions we have concluded here that capital structure makes a difference and in the capital structure if you have the mix of both internal and external sources of the funds both uh, debt and equity. So, uh, ultimately the capital structure which is having the funds from both the sources is the better capital structure and overall cost of the capital is going to go down. So, here is the one part we have seen that in this case we have assumed the tax rate means further improvement you can make here we have considered the tax rate is equal in both the components on the debt also or on the equity also. But in the real life scenario what happens? In the real life scenario the taxes on the equity uh, earnings or the earnings of the equity shareholders are far less as compared to the taxes of the say debt suppliers or the debt holders right. And if that is a situation if that happens then this kind of the picture will emerge means we have assumed in our calculations that the personal tax rate is of the 30 percent on both equity shareholders and the debt holders. But in the real life scenario what happens the say uh, capital gain as well as the dividend income of the equity shareholders is taxed at a lesser rate as compared to the say interest income going to be taxed uh, in the hands of the uh, or at the personal level while it reaches in the hands of the lenders. So, the rates are different and uh, if that is going to be the case so with the help of this model particularly you can see the effect of the debt capital on the per rupee of the borrowing. So, it means with the help of this model 1 minus 1 into uh, uh, 1 minus uh, uh, 1 minus T c into 1 minus T p e divided by 1 minus T p d. So, T c is basically the corporate tax and uh, say combined effect of the corporate tax and then the say uh, equity uh, uh, tax 
or the uh, say tax on the equity shareholders income has to be divided by the 1 minus uh, personal tax on the debt capital or the debt income especially not capital debt income. So, it means with the help of this model you can find out that if the interest rates are different uh, sorry tax rates are different uh, tax rates on the say uh, personal tax rate especially for the equity shareholders and debt holders are different which normally remain different tax rate on the debt, debt income is more as compared to the tax rate on the equity income. So, uh, ultimately the advantage of the debt further increases. Right. So, in this case you can understand here that uh, suppose uh, the corporate tax rate is 50 percent, we have assumed the corporate tax rate is 50 percent and the equity income is taxed at the personal level at the rate of 5 percent and the debt income is taxed at the again at the rate of 30 percent at the personal level. So, finally, you can say what this calculation is done here with the help of this model that the tax advantage of every rupee of the debt is how much? 32 paisa. It means tax advantage on every rupee of borrowing because given this uh, uh, say tax structure or the rate of taxes corporate tax rate is 50 percent equity income is taxed at 5 percent and debt income is taxed at 30 percent. So, if you uh, happen to uh, say have this kind of the scenario. So, ultimately the tax advantage of every rupee of the debt is 32 paisa means you can be just because of the taxes you can you can save uh, in terms of the taxes uh, 32 paisa on the every rupee of the borrowing. So, which is not possible in case of the which is not possible in case of the equity capital because equity income uh, or you can call it as the tax deductible advantage is not at the corporate level in case of the equity. So, equity uh, income uh, means uh, whatever the dividends firms pay that does not have the tax deductible advantage as compared to the say debt uh, servicing charge the interest uh, component which the firms are allowed to deduct as a say a, say uh, um, uh, you can call it as the, the cost the financial cost before uh, paying the uh, tax on that that property is not associated with the equity capital. So, if you follow this model and consider the corporate taxes and the personal taxes and the, if the tax rates are different. So, with the help of this model you can find out that tax advantage of every rupee of the borrowing every rupee of debt is 32 paisa which advantage is not there with regard to the equity capital. So, it means equity capital is also taxed at lesser rate of say uh, uh, lesser rate of tax at the personal level and at the corporate level no uh, tax deductible advantage of the equity is there. Whereas, this advantage is there at both the levels in case of the uh, say uh, debt capital uh, 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 in case of the corporate level at least the financial cost is deductible tax is tax deductible and that saves the tax up to that particular amount and because of that uh, say uh, you can call it as uh, this advantage or the debts uh, tax deductible nature the advantage of the debt is up to 32 uh, paisa you can save 32 paisa by way of uh, say not paying the taxes on the debt cost or the financial cost which we are paying uh, to the uh, debt holders for providing the debt capital in the firm. So, ultimately you can say both the taxes that is the corporate taxes and personal taxes they impact the capital structure and in both the cases debt capital uh, has the positive effect and uh, say you can save lot of money because of the tax deductible nature of the debt you can save lot of money and you can uh, means uh, ultimately the cost of capital can be brought down significantly and if the cost of capital goes down which is the ultimate purpose of a appropriate capital structure. So, uh, the, the ultimately the value of the firm gets maximized. So, we started with the discussion on the capital structure with the uh, say capital structure and the value of the firm and ultimate purpose is to find out the optimum capital structure where the cost of capital is the optimum one and ultimately the income to the equity shareholders residual income to the equity shareholders gets maximized maximizing the value of the firm. So, means if you have the debt component in the capital structure even the Maud Galani and Miller have agreed that yes because of having the debt capital which is a cheaper source of finance in the say out of the total sources. So, your overall uh, cost of capital goes down maximizing the value of the firm or the ultimate say maximizing the residual income to the equity shareholders. Now, we talk about that there are some limitations of the debt capital 
uh, which uh, do not allow the firm to enjoy the total advantages of the debt capital despite uh, 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 it uh, having the tax deductible nature or the tax deductible advantages. There are some disadvantages associated. So, you have to take those disadvantages into consideration and then try to find out that what is the real cost and for that purpose there are the two important things which are important here to be considered and first important thing is the cost of financial distress the cost of financial distress. Now, what is the financial distress and how it comes? Uh, the cost of financial distress is basically when the debt moves into the firm or the debt appears in the capital structure of the firm. So, uh, firm moves slowly and steadily towards the say financial distress, right. That is not going to happen uh, in the firm which is totally equity finance firm. Because equity is the internal source of the funds and if there is any ups and downs happen in the firm, there is no sufficient profitability or there is no sufficient liquidity in the firm, equity sh shareholders are not going to raise any hue and cry. But in case of the debt capital, if debt capital is existing in the capital structure of the firm and because of the fixed nature of the uh, say uh, debt service charge as well as the repayment of the uh, say principal component of the debt, if there is some problem in the firm with regard to its profitability, with regard to, regard to its liquidity of the profitability and if the required amount of the funds are not available at any point of time to service the debt or to repay the principal, then it brings in the financial distress in the firm, right. And that financial distress sometime if it continues much longer, then can take the firm to the say extent of liquidation or say declaring it uh, bankrupt because uh, uh, say debt suppliers or the lenders cannot wait for the un unlimited period of time. And if you are not returning their interest, if you are not paying their say, uh, say, say uh, principal component returning on time, then they can uh, take the firm to the court of law and they ask, may ask or they may plead for getting the firm declared as insolvent. So, uh, that distress cost is again a very, very important cost. So, we should consider it equally uh, means uh, being important that if the debt moves in the firm, the overall cost of capital gets down because debt is a cheaper source of the funds as compared to equity. But the real effect of that reduction in the cost of the debt cannot be enjoyed by the firm because the moment the debt moves in the firm, the distress, financial distress also comes in the firm because of the fixed nature of the obligations arising because of raising the part of the funds by way of the debt instruments from the market, right. So, there are some costs associated to the say, uh, say existence of debt in the capital structure of the firm. Uh, first is the uh, financial distress cost and second is the agency cost. These two costs we have to factor to find out the real impact of the say uh, cheaper source of the finance that is the debt capital being the cheaper source of finance. So, what is the direct cost means uh, financial distress has the two kind of the cost one is the direct cost second is the indirect cost. So, the direct cost of the financial distress is delay in liquidation may diminish the asset value, distress sale uh, fetches lower price and legal and administrative costs are high. Sometimes what happens that for example, if the firm is not doing well and uh, it, if it has to be liquidated, then there is a dispute between the equity shareholders and the say lenders and that dispute sometimes means ultimately for example, if the firm is doing very well, then fine it is there is no problem. We can service the debt also because we are getting the sufficient sales, we are getting the sufficient profits and profits are liquid also. So, we are servicing the debt also and we are returning the principal on the due date. There is no problem as such, but because of any reason if the firm has to be closed down or firm has to be liquidated, then because of the existence of both internal and external stakeholder, uh, the financial distress cost further increases and that financial distress which has caused the closure of the firm further creates the problem that uh, ultimately you have to liquidate the firm, sell off the assets of the firms in the, in the, in the market and realize the value and distribute it among us the equity and the debt suppliers. So, means because of the existence of these both the stakeholders internal and external this problem comes and the sometime dispute comes up and ultimately uh, means if you are going to sell the assets today in the market they are going to fetch the different price, but dispute continues for 1 year, 2 year, 3 years uh, means in future. So, after 3 years if you are selling the assets in the market of the financial distress firms, they are not going to get the same price. So, that is a one cost distress sale fetches lower price even otherwise also 
the say the, the debt component which has brought in the distress financial distress in the firm and which has made the firm sick. So, if you uh, want to sell off those assets of the sick firms in the market otherwise also they do not uh, say fetch the competitive price from the market and legal and administrative costs are very high because sometimes when any legal battle starts between the equity shareholders and the say uh, debt suppliers then it longs it prolongs uh, sometime very long and legal and the administrative costs uh, keep on increasing. So, there is a financial distress cost, but you see financial distress we have to subtract as a cost only if the debt is not properly managed in the firms. If the debt is not properly managed in the firms and because of the debt, because of the existence of the debt in the capital structure of the company, if any company has to be liquidated, so number one means there will be two negative uh, factors associated to the debt. Number one because of the existence of the debt in the capital structure, the firm has to face the financial distress and when you are going to now liquidate the firm has a remedy of taking it out and then closing down the business. Even in the closure or liquidation of the firm, this debt is creating the problem. So, these are the three direct costs which are coming because of the financial distress and distress is coming because of the debt and indirect costs are managers become myopic. They become totally careless, they do not pay much heed because they know also that the life of the firm is not very long, it is a distressed firm, it is a sick firm and it has to be soon sold in the market. So, their quality of the product after sales service, even payment to the creditors, they always create the problems and they do not pay heed, they miss do not spend su sufficient time. So, uh, miss the indirect cost further increases because suppliers also get annoyed, customers also get annoyed and everybody who was very happy and who was an important stakeholder in the growth of the firm now because of the say not being properly serviced they are further adding into the say financial distress of the firm. And then is the stakeholders dilute their commitment, employees you talk about, suppliers you talk about. Uh, they dilute their commitment towards the company and company which is already on the path of closure it means they, they fasten it up, they further add up to the closure of the firm to close it as quickly as possible. So, uh, means I can say here if the financial distress does not come because of the debt, if the debt comes in the capital structure and if it is properly managed then there is no issue the cost of the capital will be very low and the ultimate value of the firm will be maximized and the residual income to the equity shareholders will be maximum. But if because of the say existence of the debt in the capital structure of the firm, if the firm moves towards the financial distress then the cost is very heavy. So, we have to be very careful and consider it seriously that distress cost is there and either we should not allow the distress to come in a firm where the debt exists and in any case if it comes then we should be prepared to pay a very heavy cost. So, finally, we can say the major contributor to the financial distress is the debt, major contributor is the to the to the financial distress is the debt, the greater the level of the debt and larger the debt servicing burden associated with it the higher the probability of the financial distress. So, we have to be very careful that bring in the debt in the capital structure of the firm, but not allow the firm to go or move into the financial distress. If you are not able to service the debt, if you are not able to the pay the principal on time, mind it you are going to reduce the cost of capital by bringing more debt in the firm, but it may otherwise happen that even the entire firm may collapse and because of the non availability of the sufficient profitability because of the not proper management of the affairs of the firm, your profitability may go down and even the profits are there, but the profits are not cash profits. So, liquidity may go down and the objective with which we brought in the debt in the firm may not be met and firm moves from say maximizing rather than maximizing the value of the firm to the equity shareholders towards the financial distress and ultimately it has to be liquidated. So, we have to be very careful that debt comes as a steeper source of funds, it comes as a cheaper source of funds, but it comes with one limitation. So, be careful about that limitation, do not allow the debt to create problem in the firm and manage it clearly and carefully. So, that means as we have borrowed the debt from the market, we are efficiently make use of it and pay it back to the market. Second cost is the agency cost, second cost is the agency cost because, uh, because of the existence of the debt in the capital structure of the firm, we have two kind of the agency relationships now. One agency relationship is between the 
say uh, your shareholders and the managers right because managers manage the affairs of the companies and they are agents of the shareholders and second agency relationship is between the shareholders and the lenders or the creditors right so because that comes in the capital structure of the firm so the debt suppliers become very very careful and they sometimes start start interfering in the affairs of the firm and when they start interfering in the affairs of the firm so it increases the overall cost of the managing of the say affairs of the firm and sometimes delaying the important decisions and ultimately it tend amounts into increasing the uh, overall cost of production so you can see here what is written there is an agency relationship between the shareholders and the creditors of the firm that have substantial amount of the debt when the people or the financial institutions or maybe the lenders any other lenders when they heavily lend to the firm or provide the debt to the firm in that case they become careful about the proper use of the debt given by them to the firm and they start interfering so it means that becomes a agency relationship and <clears throat> they want shareholders should manage they or get their funds managed properly but when they are not finding the proper management of their funds they start interfering hence lenders impose restrictive covenants and monitor the behavior of the firm lenders impose restricted restrictive covenants and monitor the behavior of the firm and this monitoring cost is sometime very high which has to be paid by the firm because the loss in the efficiency on account of restrictions when they put so many restrictions say for example they say there are the three projects identified by the firm project 1 and 2 are less profitable and project 3 is highly profitable but little bit risky shareholders want that the investment should be made in the third project but the say lenders may want that no no because it is highly risky so you avoid the investment in the third project you make the proportional investment into the project 1 and project 2 so what will be miss the outcome uh, though you have managed the risk for your personal reasons but the overall return of the firm has gone down and the return to equity shareholders also has gone down so it is on the on account of restrictions on the operational the loss inefficiency on account of restrictions on operational freedom plus the cost of monitoring plus the cost of monitoring which are uh, almost invariably passed down to the shareholders represent the agency cost associated with the debt so because they want the debt suppliers never trust the shareholders and ultimately it also happens in the market that the debt suppliers sorry managers in the companies they are first agents of the shareholders the owners of the company not the agents of the debt suppliers or the debt holders so debt holders start suspecting the behavior of managers and they also start assuming shareholders are not working in their best interest so they directly in start interfering into the affairs of the firm sometimes they don't allow the investment to be made into the highly profitable but little risky projects so overall cost of capital increases and rate of return gets down and the that advantage of debt being tax deductible and being a say cheaper source of the finance as so automatically gets over and uh, sometime debt becomes uh, not cheaper but the costlier source of the finance because debt comes with the interference of the debt suppliers or the debt holders and that means uh, creates a heavy cost on account of the firm's operations and efficiency of the firm can be say negatively hampered so these two negative factors one is the say moving of the firm into financial distress because of the not properly managing the debt and second thing is existence of the agency cost because of the existence of the heavy amount of the debt from the external stakeholders these two costs create the problem so if these two costs you take into account so finally the finally the trade off becomes like this <clears throat> trade off model looks like this that on the one side you have the value of the firm here you have the debt equity ratio simply for example if this component is not there if you if you look at this this component is not there if you are say for the exa example we are applying a cut here so we say uh, everything is all normal firm is not moving into the financial distress firm is not paying any agency cost also so what is the case value of the levered firm is depicted by this straight line right this line and this line and value of the 
this is the value of the unlevered firm which is only equity financed and value of the firm considering the tax advantage of the debt is this much because it is going up because ultimately the cost of capital is going down. So, the value of the firm is going up, but this does not go this way this behavior of the say say firms income is not like this because in between this this gap comes here. So, this gap comes because of or this obstacle comes because of the financial distress cost and the agency cost right. So, when the financial distress and agency cost create the problem because of the debt capital existing in the capital structure of the firm. So, finally, you can say value of the firm considering the tax advantage and the financial distress and agency cost becomes like this. So, it does not go like this it behaves like this it comes like this. So, it means gap is not this much gap does not become this much, but the gap comes this much. So, we have to be very careful that debt capital is a cheaper source of finance comes to the firm reduces the overall cost of capital, but at the same time it comes with the two limitations also it may take the firm towards the financial distress and it may say <coughs> create the extra problems for the managers of the firm because of existence of the agency relationship and because of the extra interference of the debt holders. So, if these two costs are carefully taken care of then ultimate advantage of the debt as a cheaper source of finance can be enjoyed, but if these two sources are not uh, sorry these two limitations are not properly managed or not taken care of then that tax deductible nature of the debt or debt being a cheaper source of the finance can be mis uh, can 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 not be enjoyed by the firm. So, we have to be very careful that debt is cheaper source of finance provided the financial distress does not come in the way and agency cost does not create a problem. If these two limitations exist then the ultimate advantage of debt being the cheaper source of finance cannot be enjoyed to the extent as it was perceived to be. So, we have to be very careful about these two limitations otherwise what will happen the income will not go up like this income will be say moving in a curved form it will start going up, but then the agency cost and the financial distress will start creating a problem. So, the gap between the income of the levered firm and unlevered firm will be minimizing. So, do not allow this gap to be minimized and take care of the financial distress and the agency cost and keep the say cost of the debt intact and ultimately say make sure that we have reduced the cost of the capital overall cost of the capital with the objective of maximizing the value of the firm. So, this is the trade off approach this is the say second proposition of the Modigliani and Miller approach and this is very very rational approach. So, in the second proposition of the MM approach of the capital structure Modigliani and Miller themselves have accepted that capital structure makes a difference and because of that say existence of taxes debt capital becomes cheaper. So, we should have the optimum mix of the debt and equity to have the optimum capital structure. Now, I take you to the next level and that is the say two more theories of the capital structure one is the packing order of financing and second is the next is the signaling theory right. So, these two more theories are there. So, if you talk to the these uh, say packing order and the signaling theory. So, we will see here that uh, what is the packing order uh, theory of the financing which was given to us in 1961 by the Gordon Donaldson. Gordon Donaldson after studying the capital structure of different companies he propounded a different theory of the capital structure and he said that there is a packing order of financing which goes as follows that as per this theory first of all the firms make use of the internal capital then they make use of the debt finance and then they make use of the external equity. This Donaldson has say concluded after studying the capital structure of the many uh, firms in the market and he has said that capital structure uh, is important he has also not denied the Modigliani Miller theory because Modigliani and Miller theory have uh, assumed that there is a complete market uh, say uh, clarification and complete information symmetry exists and managers and investors know each and everything about the market and complete transparency exists in the market. So, if the complete transparency exists in the market information symmetry exists in the market then certainly the trade off theory or the second proposition of the Modigliani and Miller is, is, is important theory. But sometimes when there is a say informational asymmetry in the market and clear information is not available to the investors and managers about that how the firms are doing or maybe uh, a new firm want to enter in any industry where other firms are already existing. So, if you want to draw a clue 
about the capital structure of the new firm by drawing a clue from the capital structure of the existing firms. So, in that case uh, we can uh, uh, say that if the information is easily available about that how much uh, say uh, risk is there, how much a return is there, how taxes are going to impact it. So, finally, you can have the proper capital structure having the uh, different proportion of the debt and equity. So, that happens in case of the complete information symmetry in case of the complete information, uh, uh, information transformation from the one uh, say. Uh, uh, place to the another place from the one account to the another account. But if complete information asymmetry is there or information is not easily available, transparency is not there, then to know about the capital structure, uh, normally it has been found that this theory can be made use of where the packing order says that uh, the, the, the total sources of the funds used in the firms are uh, on the basis of the packing order and the packing order of these sources of the funds is number one firms make use of the internal sources of the funds which is a retained earnings. Then they go for the borrowings from the market and then they go for the external uh, equity finance. So, finally, it is written here given the packing order of financing there is no well defined target of debt equity ratio right. If there is no complete transparency in the market information uh, symmetry is not there then what will happen the proper debt equity ratio cannot be created as there are two kinds of equity internal and external right. So, while the internal equity is at the top of the packing order the external equity is at the bottom. So, this theory says that if there is a complete market information asymmetry information is not available and uh, say investors and managers are not able to take the proper decision about the capital structure. So, what they can do is they can see how the existing firms are doing in the market how their capital structure is decided and after studying some say uh, existing firms capital structure Gordon Donaldson has propounded a theory that there is no point of looking at the debt and equity and anything right. First of all firms now, because equity is of the two types, this theory creates a problem that they say that equity is of the two types. Retained earnings are also internal fund, you can call them at as equity and say, say external equity by issuing the new shares in the market that is also the equity. So, which equity you are talking about in case of the trade off theory, right. So, you cannot much rely upon the say capital structure is better that you follow the packing order and on the basis of what he has observed from the practical situation in the market he has said firms raise the funds in this order. First they raise the funds from the internal sources of the finance because there is no flotation cost. Raising the funds are very easy because they are internally available right and that is the first source and after that when they go to the say further requirement of the funds. If there is a further requirement of the funds, then they do not issue the new fresh equity in the market rather they prefer to borrow from the market. And why they prefer to borrow from the market? Because of the three advantages. First is the that debt is not mispriced. Whatever the rate of interest we are going to pay on the borrowings or on the debt that is going to be as per the market rates. So, we are not going to be uh, say we are not going to get affected negatively <coughs> this is the one part. Second part is the, uh, the, the positive part is that it is not going to affect the say uh, the, the, the position of the equity shareholders and third is that uh, since uh, the control is not going to be diluted from the equity shareholders because it is external source of the finance it has to be only serviced in terms of the interest and in terms of the repayment of the principal. So, the dilution of the control of the equity shareholder is not going to be there equity shareholders position is not going to be affected in any other sense and it is not mispriced also means easily you can find out what is the cost of borrowing from the market. So, because of these three properties raising of the debt is cheaper as compared to raising of the funds by issuing fresh equity in the market because the flotation cost is very high the process is quite tedious. So, the say this he says that capital structure you cannot follow in all the cases because of having that two kind of the internal sources of the funds retained earnings and the equity capital. So, the better theory of the capital structure is the packing order theory and this is what the firms are following in the market. He has observed after studying the capital structure of the firms they are not following the trade off theory that bringing the equal amount of capital from debt and equity, but they are following the packing order and first they are depending upon the internal sources of funds then number 2 is the debt and number 3 is the say external 
uh, sources of the funds or the, you can call it as the external equity finance which is coming up by issuing the equity uh, shares, fresh shares in the market. So, means uh, this is the uh, say another theory you can call it as the fifth theory of the capital structure and it is very uh, helpful also say to know about that if you are not able to decide properly because of the lack of the proper market information and in the event of the information asymmetry if it is very difficult to decide the capital structure having the say different proportions of or proportions of the debt and equity then always it is better that we should follow the packing order theory first raise the funds from internal sources because it is not going to create any problem for the firm second is go for the raising the debt from the market and third is then if still you require the fund then issue the fresh equity in the market and raise the remaining amount of the funds. But be careful if you raise the funds from the debt distress may come or debt may take the firm towards the financial distress or it may create the agency problem. So, we have to be very careful if we are means careful about these two negative limitations of the debt capital then if you are not able to follow the second proposition of the Morgulani and Miller theory then it is better to follow the packing order theory. One more theory is the last theory that is called as the uh, signaling theory. I will miss give the reference of the signaling theory. Signaling theory is basically given to us by the Stewart uh, C. Myers, Stewart C. Myers and the Nicholas Majlov in 1984. And Nicholas Majlov, these are the two economists who have given the signaling theory, and basically they have extended the packing order theory given to us by the Mr. This your uh, Gordon Donaldson. This theory they extended and they called it the new theory which they propounded. These two people, uh, they 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 called and they propounded a new theory. Uh, which is known as basically the contribution of these two people Stuart C. Uh, Myers and the say uh, your uh, uh, Nicholas Majlov who gave this theory in 1984 and they named it as a signaling theory and signaling theory he says that uh, these two economists say that normally the say uh, your second proposition of the Modigliani and Miller has to be held good if there is a complete uh, information symmetry right if there is a complete uh, information symmetry in the market then it is better to decide the capital structure by having the different proportions of debt and equity depending upon their respective cost. But if it is not possible to find out and there is a complete market information asymmetry or proper information is not available managers and investors are not able to decide that from where to raise the funds and how to expect or how much return to expect on particular investment then it is better to follow the packing order theory right. So, what is the signaling theory what they have said? Noting the inconsistency between the trade off and the packing order financing because trade off says there has to be proper say composition of debt and equity, equity. Packing order says there is nothing like that, there is a complete information asymmetry in the market. So, the capital structure has to be decided in the form of three sources first is internal, second is borrowing, third is external equity. So, Myers proposed a new theory, theory called the signaling or the asymmetric information theory of the capital structure. This name of this theory is another name of the theory is the asymmetric information because when the complete market information is not available then only on the basis of the signals available from the market or the capital structure of the existing firms you can decide that what should be the capital structure of the new firm in the industry and how you can have the signals. Signals basically come from because ultimately the managers decide the capital structure of the firm and since they are the insiders in the firm who manage the affairs of the firm. So, they have the complete internal information about the financial health of the firm. Right. So, whatever the capital structure, if there is a complete standard capital structure like say uh, the trade of theory proposed by the Modigliani and Miller, then signaling theory has no say, even the packing order theory has no say. But packing order theory and signaling theory become important when the market is not completely transparent and it is not possible to find out how firms decide the capital structure, then either the packing order becomes important or signaling theory becomes important signaling theory means why it is called as a signaling theory that you can draw the signal from the capital structure of the existing firms decided by the managers of the firms because they are insiders in the firm who manage the affairs of the firm and they know the financial health of the firm. So, keeping 
into consideration the overall financial health of the firm, they decide the capital structure of the firm. So, you just try to draw a signal that from where the funds are being raised by the existing firms in the industry, are they are coming from internal sources, retained earnings, debt capital or equity capital. But that will only happen in case of the lack of the proper information or in the event of the information asymmetry. If there is a proper complete information symmetry information is available in the market, then the second theory of the Modigliani uh, Mol, uh, Miller proposition will be held good and capital structure will be decided on the basis of the equal proportions of debt and equity. But if that is not going to be possible, then draw the either you follow the packing order theory or you draw the you follow the signaling theory because whatever is the existing capital structure of the firms that gives a signal to the outsiders because that capital structure is decided by the managers, they are the internal stakeholders, they know the complete information about the firm's financial health. So, how they have decided the capital structure, maybe they are going to decide the best capital structure of the firm and if the firm is successful by following that capital structure, so it is a signal to the rest of the world that the capital structure of the new firm in the market also has to be what is the existing capital structure of the existing firms in the market. So, you draw the signal from the existing capital structure which is decided by the internal stakeholders who are managers of the firms and then you draw the new capital structure, you decide the new capital structure of the new firms. So, finally, they say a critical premise of the trade of theory is that all parties have the same information and homogeneous expectations. If this held, this it holds good that all parties have the complete information and homogeneous expectations, then there is no alternative of the trade of theory or the second proposition of the Modigliani and Miller. But if Mar Myers argued that if there is a asymmetric information, if there is a asymmetric information, complete information about the capital structure is not available and divergent expectations and divergent expectations which explain the pecking order of the financing observed in practice. Right. Myers argued that there is asymmetric information and divergent expectations which explain the packing order of the financing observed in the practice. Because if there is a complete information available, there is no alternative of the second proposition of the Modigliani Miller theory. You have to have the optimum capital structure of the firm to reduce the cost of the capital. But if there is a lack of information symmetry in the market or a complete information asymmetry exists, then naturally uh, you have to follow either the packing order theory or you have to draw the signals from the existing capital structure of the firms and decide the capital structure of the new firm because that signal is very important that how the existing capital structure of the firms is decided. Have they used the first the say retained earnings? or they have used the debt capital secondly and thirdly they have used the equity capital or there is any other way of deciding the capital structure. So, you draw the signal either you follow the packing order theory or you draw the signal from the existing capital structure of the firms and decide the new capital structure of the new firm. So, these are different theories available which we discussed till now and we started with the net income approach, then we moved to the net operating income approach, then we moved to the traditional uh, say, uh, approach and all these approaches, all these approaches are considered as non-systematic approaches, non-scientific approaches of the capital structure. And in 1958, one scientific approach came up given by the Modigliani and Miller and later on they improved their first proposition, came with the second proposition which became popular as a trade-off theory because it is a trade-off between the risk and return. And means normally this second theory, trade-off theory which is a replica of the net income approach is, is uh, say prevalent in the market for deciding the capital structure and the capital structure has a meaning. People say even today that the capital structure has a meaning more the amount of the debt overall cost of capital of the firm goes down because that is the cheaper source of the finance. Uh, but trade off theory is possible to be followed only if there is a complete information and homogeneous expectations of all the stakeholders that is investors and managers and uh, even even the owners of the company right but if the complete information is not available that how to decide the proportions of debt and equity what is the cost of debt what is the cost of equity and what are the expectations of managers and investors in that case two other theories are there either you can follow the packing order theory where we can use the retained earnings first then the debt number 2 and number 3 is the 
equity capital raised by issuing the fresh equity in the market or even if the packing order theory is not possible to be followed then we can say use the say signaling theory which was given which is a modification of basically extension not modification extension of the packing order theory given to us by the Stuart C. Myers and the Nicholas Majlaf in 1984 and I would add here this this signaling theory was first propounded in 1977 by Professor Ross in which was further means uh, extended by these two uh, financial economists Stuart C. Myers and the Nicholas uh, Majlaf in 1984 and basically this signaling theory is the extension of the packing order theory and if you are not able to follow any of the approaches including the packing order then you use the signaling theory and whatever the signals you get from the existing firms the capital structure from the market you also decide the capital structure of the new firm accordingly. So, as far as the conceptual part the, so the, the, the you can call it is the discussion on the capital structure was concerned I have done it to the uh, say extent possible till now we have started with the introductory part of the capital structure and discuss the importance of the capital structure and then we discuss the different theories of the capital structure. So, say uh, I will stop here with the say discussion on the capital structure, but complete discussion will be over only once we do uh, one uh, at least one practical problem on the capital structure that how the capital structure of the firms impact the overall cost of capital. So, if there is a existing capital structure of the firm and if the cost of capital is more. So, if you want to raise further capital for the expansion or diversification or further growth of the firm. So, we have to be very carefully say look for the sources of the funds which ultimately bring down the overall cost of capital of the firm. So, I will discuss one practical problem. Uh, but not in this class in the next class after that I will completely close the discussion on the capital structure and move to move to the next part and that is the last topic of this uh, course as a whole and that will be the dividend decisions. So, one practical problem on the capital structure and the next topic dividend decisions I will start talking to you in the next class till then thank you very much. <laughs>